Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second Meet the Astronomer lecture for this February from Vanderbilt University Dyer Observatory. So I'm Dr. Billy Teets, and I'm going to be our MC for this evening. So before we begin, I just want to have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Alex Rockefeller, Helen Morissette, who are helping as co-pilots for, for this evening. And then we've got Brian Smokler of VU News and Communications, who is getting our broadcast out to you all tonight. So I want to thank them first and foremost. Um, I do have a couple of quick little slides that I wanted to show you right quick. So we've got on our website, a couple of resources out of the many resources I think you'll find particularly interesting uh, on the next clear night that we have. Uh, we've got a, um, a celestial events calendar for this February and our March calendar is coming up. Um, Alex Rockefeller put these together. So we're uh, delighted to be able to share those with you. They are chock full of information and you're going to learn something every month that you read through these calendars. So uh, go to our homepage and you'll be able to see those. Uh, we've also got a few star charts. So again, the next clear night, go out with one of these star charts and learn what's up in the night sky. So uh, we've got a really nice version, as you see on the left, that's color, looks great on a computer screen. But if you would like to print out something and you don't want to use up all of your, your ink and your printer, then we've got a black and white version as well. So again, full of information and it'll learn you a little bit about what's up in the, the night sky uh, for this time of year. And then finally, if you haven't followed us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, please be sure to check us out on there. Uh, we post lots of information on there, usually on a daily basis, including announcements for upcoming events that we have. So tonight, I am delighted to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Taylor. So Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy at Vanderbilt University. Originally from Northern Ireland, Ireland, Dr. Taylor studied physics at Oxford from 2006 to 2010 before earning his PhD in Cambridge in 2014. He was awarded a NASA postdoctoral fellowship in 2014 to research gravitational wave science at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Caltech in Pasadena, California. He joined Vanderbilt University as a faculty member in 2019. And tonight he is going to talk to us about detecting gravitational waves from some of the most massive black holes in the universe. So without further ado, Dr. Taylor, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Teets, and to Alex, Helen, and Brian as well for uh, making this evening run smoothly. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone. So let me go ahead and share my slides uh, for tonight. All right, so as Dr. Teet said, I'm going to talk about how we can detect gravitational waves from the heaviest, meaning the most massive black holes in the entire universe. This is something I've been working on with many colleagues for the last several years, and it's, uh, it's very exciting, and it's uh, showing some excellent signs of making the next big breakthrough in gravity research. Before we get to that, though, let me uh, just briefly expand on uh, on what uh, Dr. Teets mentioned about me. Um, as he said, I come from Northern Ireland. I come from a very small village of about 6,000 people in, uh, in the north of Ireland, uh, part of the UK. And uh, I studied physics at Oxford after, uh, after leaving there. And this is a nice picture of a building called the Radcliffe Camera, which is a, a library uh, surrounded by lots of nice buildings. Uh, after that, I earned my PhD in astronomy from the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge. Here's a, a nice picture of students punting along the River Cam with, uh, with King's College in the background there. And after that, I left the UK and uh, started my postdoctoral research at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in California. Um, and part of that means that I was also able to work at Caltech, California Institute of Technology, which is only a few miles away from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so some of these are very nice, ni nice sites. Uh, you know, you've got the NASA meatball straight outside the front door to take nice pictures in front of. Caltech has the Millikan Library right there. Um, very beautiful places. 
And in 2019, I was fortunate enough to join Van der Gold's faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I wanted to uh, flash up a quick image of my research group uh, as it stands at the moment. Obviously, we're all meeting online, um, but they're all incredibly hardworking. It's a privilege to work with them and, and to see their, their efforts and their talents flourish. So we're going to talk about gravitational waves and black holes in particular. Uh, it makes sense that we should start by understanding what gravity is. And I think when we all uh, hear the word gravity and we think about the stories surrounding uh, gravity research, this is the picture that we have in our minds. It's uh, a picture of Sir Isaac Newton in the 1680s, sitting under an apple tree in, uh, in a small village where his family's farm was. And at the time he was taking refuge from Cambridge uh, because lots of the big towns and, uh, and cities had suffered uh, an outbreak of bubonic plague. And so he, uh, he left and uh, was quarantining in, uh, in his family's farm. And the story goes that he was hit on the head with an apple and the, the solitude and uh, the refuge on his family's farm allowed him to have time to think and reflect. Uh, that kind of reflection is possibly not, uh, not possible today with all of our distractions, but he found a lot of time to, to think about gravity and what it actually meant. What he came up with, uh, with was the most successful theory um, of gravity for over 200 years. And in 1687, Isaac Newton published his theory of gravity, which stated that more massive objects or closer objects will feel more strongly attracted to each other. And the force of attraction goes as the product, basically the multiplication of the masses of the objects and the inverse square of the, di of the distance between them. And this theory was very successful. It's very simple and elegant. It's good enough for over 200 years. So good, in fact, that it allowed us to navigate to the moon. Okay, so this was a very successful theory. For most cases, we don't actually need to modify um, Isaac Newton's understanding of gravity. It's very successful. However, the cracks in the theory started to show up in the late 19th century. Mercury had a problem with its orbit. Its orbit didn't actually agree with Newton's theory of gravitation. And the problem was that Mercury's position of closest approach to the sun appeared to be moving. It was advancing along its orbit over time. So over many, many orbits of Mercury, its position of closest approach appeared to be moving along the orbital path itself. This was a problem. It didn't agree with Newton's theory of gravity. And there were several theories proposed to explain what could be the problem. Um, one of the most popular at the time was that there was actually another planet that was inside the orbit of Mercury that was acting as some sort of perturbing influence and thus affecting Mercury's orbit. And they even came up with a name for what this planet could be. They called it the planet Vulcan. And there were many, many searches for this planet, but to no avail, they couldn't find it. So along comes a young scientist called Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein decided that this was not a new planet. It was actually requiring a new phrasing of what gravity is. And in his theory of gravity, gravity is not a pulling force like, um, like magnetism or electricity. It's just gravity being a byproduct. It's really just something that falls out of our understanding um, of objects trying to travel in straight lines through curved space time. So the Earth and all the other, other planets are really trying to go in straight lines, um, but they're being curved around in, in the curved space time of the sun. The reason why the sun curves space and time is that it's a massive object. So every massive object will create a dent in the fabric of space and time, which will cause objects around it to be deflected in their passage. So gravity really is just a byproduct. It's a name we give to a larger theory that says that space and time are curved in the presence of massive objects. And you can see that illustrated right here. We've got a large object, which could be the sun sitting in the center. And it creates this uh, region of curvature in this grid. This grid is representing the structure of space and time, which we unify into a four dimensional object called space time. 
And then this tiny object kind of just puckering the surface of this, uh, uh, of this grid could be the Earth, or it could be Mercury, could be any object that might be in orbit around another object. And it's creating its own small curvature as well, its own small dent, but it's nowhere near as big as the larger object. So the Earth um, is trying to go in this straight line, but it's being deflected in this gravity well that the sun uh, has created. And that's what's being illustrated right here. You know, the Earth is trying its best to go in a straight line, um, but it's doing that in a space that's actually curved. It's intrinsically curved by the presence of the sun. Now, the fact that we can curve space-time implies that we've got not a rigid object. The universe is not a rigid uh, material. It can be warped and it can be stretched and it can be squeezed. And that permits wave solutions. So in Einstein's theory of gravity, there can actually be waves of gravitational influence that we call gravitational waves. And here is just a quick illustration that we'll see a lot more, um, we'll hear a lot more about later. These are two stars that are orbiting each other. As they're orbiting each other, they're churning up the fabric of space-time like, like you would churn up butter, and you're creating these waves of influence, gravitational influence that are propagating outwards. And they propagate outwards at the speed of light. And they carry information about the systems that produce them. So Einstein's theory allows space and time, space time, to stretch and squeeze to make waves. These waves will travel out at the speed of light. Um, we shouldn't really call it the speed of light. Um, we should call it the speed of information because gravity, electromagnetism all propagate at that speed. And even though space-time can warp, it is still quite rigid. Um, we do need very, very dense objects like black holes or neutron stars or white dwarfs to cause this kind of warping and this kind of gravitational wave creation. Okay, this seems like a strange diagram, but this is what gravitational waves would do if they were propagating, if they were moving into the screen or out of the screen um, as you're looking at it. So if we had a gravitational wave that was moving into the screen or out of the screen, and we had just an arrangement of objects, say beads on a wire, then the gravitational wave would stretch and squeeze space-time in the plane perpendicular to the direction that it's moving. So it would actually cause these, these strange stretch, stretching and squeezing uh, patterns in the plane of the screen itself. And these two patterns you're seeing here actually correspond to what we call different polarizations of gravitational waves. And they're called the plus and the cross polarization. The left one is the cross, the right one is the plus. Hopefully you can see why that is. But really, if you focus on the right-hand one, you'll see that it's stretching in a vertical direction and then stretching in a horizontal direction um, alternately. So that's the plus shape. And then on the left, it's offset by about 45 degrees. So it's stretching along the diagonals and it's creating a cross shape. Okay, so those are the polarizations of gravitational waves. They only create stretching and squeezing in the plane of the screen itself, and they travel at the speed of light. If you wanted a different angle on this, uh, on this gravitational wave, let's move to the side a little bit and look at it uh, as it's moving, say, at an angle. Um, this seems like, again, a kind of a strange visualization, but if the gravitational wave were moving at, a, at an angle towards us, then it would stretch space and time um, outwards and inwards uh, uh, perpendicular to the direction that it's moving. Perpendicular just meaning at a 90 degree angle to the direction that it's moving. Now, before you've seen the problem in abstract, what gravitational waves are in abstract, but we should look at a more concrete example of what makes these gravitational waves. And I alluded to this earlier that two stars very dense stars could create gravitational waves. And this is a perfect visualization of that. This is actually a real um, highly complex numerical simulation on a supercomputer uh, performed by the SXS collaboration that shows two black holes orbiting each other. As they orbit each other, they're sending out gravitational waves. And I'll play the video in a little second, but 
as they send out gravitational waves, you'll start to see that the orbit loses energy. And as the orbit of the two black holes loses energy, they have to get tighter together. And that just increases the strength with which they send out gravitational waves. The strength increases as they get closer together. So it's a feedback loop. And eventually, as you'll see in this video, um, the black holes will get so close together, they'll eventually merge, like two water droplets merging together to form an even larger black hole. The reason why you're seeing strange optical effects is because this actually incorporates the, uh, the influence of light from background stars moving around the black holes and being bent and warped. So the light itself has been deflected as it moves towards us. Okay, so gravitational waves, we think we understand them. They've had a very rich history um, and a checkered history at that. They were first predicted, predicted almost immediately after Einstein developed his general theory of relativity and he predicted gravitational waves in 1916. However, Einstein changed his mind. He decided in the 30s that gravitational waves were not real. They were just a mathematical artifact, um, really just a, an artifact of his, of his equations, but not something that was actually physical that could be produced. Um, he changed his mind eventually, but, uh, but it really put a, a a dampener on people's feelings about gravitational waves for a long time that the creator, the, the originator of the theory was against the fact that they were physical. Now in the late sixties, gravitational waves were, were falsely claimed to have been detected. Um, and this really started the first experimental efforts to detect gravitational waves. Um, the detection process back then was to get a large bar of metal and hook it up to sophisticated electronics and then observe if the metal rod was resonating at a particular frequency. And the theory was that if a gravitational wave entered the earth and interacted with this metal bar, that it would resonate. It would absorb energy and resonate at a certain frequency. Um, and while those detections were falsely claimed back in the 60s, they were really instrumental in starting people thinking about how we would do gravitational wave detection in practice. Now in the 70s, a special type of star was discovered. This was um, a pulsar in orbit around another star. And we'll, we'll come back to this, to this system and this particular type of star, a pulsar, uh, later in the talk because they are at the foundation of how I try to detect gravitational waves with my colleagues. But this particular system, which has a very complicated name called B1913 plus 16, um, was a, a pulsar in orbit around another star. The great thing about pulsars is that they act like cosmic lighthouses. They whip around beams of radiation towards us, um, allowing us to time them really well. And they allow us to map out the uh, particular dynamics of the orbit of this uh, system of two stars. And we can see from these pulsar timing observations that the orbit is actually decaying. Why is it decaying? Well, because the system is emitting gravitational waves and it's slowly moving towards coalescence. Uh, the discovery of this special type of system was uh, awarded a Nobel prize in 1993. And it's often credited as uh, the first indirect evidence of gravitational waves in nature. Now let's move along a couple of decades. And what we get to is the year 2015. Now what happened in 2015? Well, finally, LIGO was able to detect gravitational waves from the merger of two black holes. Um, this merger happened billions of uh, light years away and, uh, and a, that information traveled at the speed of light. It got to us um, on September uh, 14th, 2015 and then was announced by the LIGO collaboration um, on February 11th, 2016. And in 2017, uh, all of this amazing work that culminated, culminated in detection of gravitational waves was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Three scientists in particular were singled out. Uh, there was Ray Weiss, uh, who worked a lot on the initial designs for 
the LIGO detector. Don't worry, I'll get to LIGO pretty soon and what that stands for. Barry Barish, who was instrumental in uh, making sure that the LIGO collaboration was organized and had a science mission and was, um, was well operational. And then Kip Thorne, who was um, an extraordinary, is an extraordinary theoretical physicist and really drove the theory of gravitational waves and the development that would allow us to detect them. And in this picture, you've got me holding Kip Thorne's Nobel Prize medal um, at a party in his house in 2017, uh, maybe 2018 actually. Um, as you can see, I'm quite giddy at holding this Nobel Prize medal um, and it's heavier than it looks. Um, but that was a very special moment, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, acknowledgement of the amazing science that has been done by LIGO and many scientists worldwide. Now LIGO, what does LIGO actually mean? I've talked about LIGO. LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. You might have heard about this before. Um, this is one example of, uh, of a, a type of detector that, um, that LIGO is. It's, a, it's called a laser interferometer. And really you have um, an L-shape detector. Hopefully you can see that. It's, it's in the shape of an L, a letter L. And each, um, each length of the, of the arm is a, a few kilometers long. And so we send beams of radiation down these different arms. They reflect off the end, they come back, they reflect off, they come back. And then eventually the beams are recombined and we look at the recombined information. Here's a little video showing how that happens. Initially, we start off with uh, a laser source. That laser source sends a beam towards a mirror, which then splits the beam in two. Each beam will travel along the length of its respective L arm. It'll reflect back. And if gravitational waves are actually interacting with this detector, then the gravitational wave will stretch one arm, but it will squeeze, squeeze the other. So if you, if you remember the plus and the cross pattern, it'll alternately stretch one arm and squeeze the other. So what that means is the laser light, when it comes back and is recombined, will actually be out of phase. And that will produce a very distinctive pattern at a photodiode, um, which is the detector readout. And that pattern of, uh, of recombination errors, that pattern of out of phaseness, will tell you about what has produced the gravitational waves, the strength of the gravitational waves. And we can infer the masses of the objects. We can infer how far away they are. We can do lots of amazing science with this detector. And this is what was discovered on September 14th, 2015. It looks innocuous enough, but really this is the fingerprint of two black holes that are each about 30 times as big as the sun, coalescing and producing an even bigger black hole. So as time goes on here, and the time is quite short, it's only a few hundred milliseconds. As time goes on, you see the distinctive peaks and troughs get closer and closer together, and the amplitude of those peaks and troughs gets bigger as well. Eventually, at about 0 0.40 seconds, roughly, you get the coalescence of the black holes, and then the signal dies down again. Now, the amazing thing is that each of these black holes were about 30 times as big as the sun, but the final black hole was only about 57 times as big as the sun. That means that three times the material of the sun was converted into energy, according to E equals mc squared, and then emitted as gravitational waves at the speed of light. That's just an extraordinary amount of energy. This system was incredibly luminous when it emitted gravitational waves. It was a very strong signal. And the results are quite clear. Einstein was correct. The theory has been validated. It was one of the last remaining aspects of gravity of general relativity that had not been confirmed and it's been directly detected and validated. Again, this is showing a very distinctive fingerprint of the gravitational waves being detected in two of LIGO's detectors. Uh, there is a site for LIGO in Hanford in Washington state. There's also one in Livingston, Louisiana. The amazing thing is that you can take the information from both of those detectors and combine it 
to get a stronger uh, source of information for the gravitational waves. Um, and what's even more impressive is that if you look at the delay time that the signal was received in Hanford versus Livingston, delay time agrees with gravitational waves traveling at the speed of light. And these gravitational waves are able to easily penetrate through the Earth um, unimpeded and uh, don't find any problem doing that. They, they're interacting very, very weakly with matter. So we don't notice gravitational waves uh, in our everyday lives. It takes these very sophisticated detectors in order to even measure the smallest signal from gravitational waves. LIGO is an extraordinary instrument. And to give you an idea of how extraordinary, it's so sensitive that it's essentially a giant ruler measuring distances and how distances can be stretched and squeezed. And its precision is such that it could measure the distance between Earth and Proxima Centauri, which is the next star system over a few light years away. It could measure that distance to the width of a human hair. And that's the kind of length precision that, uh, that LIGO can achieve. Now, LIGO is one part of the rich tapestry of gravitational waves. It's not the whole story. LIGO can detect black holes that are, as I said, tens of times as big as the sun, maybe a hundred times as big as the sun, but it can't detect systems any larger. To do that, you actually need to go lower in gravitational wave frequency where LIGO and other similar detectors are not sensitive. Now, why would we want to do that? Why would we want to go lower in frequency and try to find bigger black holes? How do we know that they exist? Well, let me build an analogy with how the electromagnetic universe has been pursued and discovered. We originally started looking at the night sky with our naked eye and simple optical telescopes. And that certainly allowed us to see a lot, but not the whole universe. And in fact, as our technology and as our scientific capabilities improved, so did our ability to see the universe in vastly different ways. So as we've stretched our abilities across the spectrum of light to see ultraviolet waves, to see X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves, we've seen vastly new phenomena. We've seen the same phenomena in different ways. Our knowledge about the universe has drastically improved. And the same is true for gravitational waves. There's an entire landscape of gravitational waves that have not been discovered yet. And that's my goal, and that's the goal of my colleagues as well, to really fill in parts of the landscape uh, and the map of gravitational waves that we have not explored yet. One part of that landscape is the LISA detector. So LISA is sensitive to gravitational wave frequencies lower than LIGO. Uh, the frequencies are roughly millihertz. And LISA stands for the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. So this would be a sequence of three satellites in space. Each of the satellites would be separated by 2.5 million kilometers. And this constellation of three satellites would trail the orbit of the Earth as the Earth orbits around the sun. The satellites would beam laser light towards each other and then send that around in an equilateral triangle shape. Let me show you what that looks like, a little video. Okay, so there's the constellation of three satellites. They're in free fall, which means that um, they're not connected by any rigid system. They're just orbiting around the sun and following the earth as it orbits around the sun. It, it, it will be an extraordinary system. And like I said, they're separated by 2.5 million kilometers. Now, Lisa, is not active at the moment. It's due for launch in the year 2034. Much work has to be done in order to get it ready, but it will be an extraordinary detector and could give us detections of black holes somewhere between 10,000 times as big as the sun and 10 million times as big as the sun and could be an amazing detector that would allow us to do tests of gravity. So we could try to break Einstein's theory of gravity and move beyond that if we need to. Um, and LISA will allow us to do that. Now, I said I would get back to a very special type of star, a special type of system. The special star was a pulsar. Um, a pulsar is a neutron star. 
Um, a neutron star is the collapsed core of a star that has gone undergone supernova. And what it leaves is this neutron star, which is incredibly dense. <clears throat> it's the last stage before a star would collapse into a black hole. It's only about 10 to 15 kilometers across, but it would weigh as much as the sun. So if I was to take a spoonful of neutron star material, um, it would weigh as much as the Empire State Building. That's how dense it is. And it's only supported against collapse into a black hole by something called neutron degeneracy pressure. It's a type of quantum degeneracy pressure that's supporting it against collapse. Now pulsars are an even more special type of neutron star that, um, that actually rotate very, very quickly. Some of them as fast as a kitchen blender. So you can imagine something that's 10 to 15 kilometers across, you know, as big as the greater Nashville area, spinning hundreds of times a second that, was, that weighs as much as the sun. It's an incredible astrophysical object. Um, the lines you're seeing here in this video are magnetic field lines. So they're also very strongly magnetic. And as they rotate around, they're kind of like a rapidly rotating dynamo. Um, the magnetic field, which is when it's rotating, actually generates an electric field. And the electric field can accelerate particles that eventually produces very strong radio pulses along the, uh, along the magnetic field lines. These amazing objects were discovered in 1967 by a graduate student at the University of Cambridge, um, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, she's an extraordinary scientist, still active in the field, and we owe a ton to her uh, for making this science possible. Now, this is just a, an easier way of seeing how we can use these pulsars in our science, um, because these pulsars are used at an even lower frequency than the LISA detector to find lower frequency gravitational waves. Um, the gravitational waves that these pulsars are used to detect are at nanohertz frequencies. So that's zero point with nine zeros um, hertz. Um, so these are incredibly low frequency. These pulsars are used as part of our instrument. So we're not using satellites or we're not using long tubes across the earth. We're using astrophysical objects themselves, these pulsars, as an essential part of our detection process. How can we use these pulsars? These pulsars are incredibly standard clocks. Um, what I mean by that is that every time the beam of radiation whips around as it rotates, uh, we register a radio pulse in our detectors. That radio pulse is very regular, which means that we can time it incredibly well. Um, we can build up very sophisticated models for when we expect these pulses to arrive. And anything that changes that um, has us thinking, what, what could have caused that perturbation? What could have caused that change? There are many things. One of them is the influence of gravitational waves, stretching and squeezing the fabric of space-time in between us and the pulsar. So here's just a schematic diagram of what that could look like. We can time these pulses very, very well. We build up very sophisticated models in terms of various characteristics of the pulsar system itself. But what we don't take into account initially is the influence of gravitational waves. And a gravitational wave that's passing between the Earth and the pulsar will actually change, change the separation between the Earth and the pulsar. It'll stretch it and then it'll squeeze it and it'll stretch it again. So we're using the space time between the Earth and the pulsar as a giant ruler. Um, and we're measuring that just by the regularity of the arrival times of these pulses. And if they're, if they're not regular, and if there's some change to them, some deviation, then that allows us to uh, look into those and check if gravitational waves could have caused that. So here's a nice video that shows this entire process. Here's a gravitational wave moving into our galaxy. It's coming from somewhere else in the universe. It moves into our galaxy and then passes between the Earth and the pulsar and then causes effectively Doppler shifts in the arrival rates of these pulses um, and it changes them. Now, unfortunately, we can't just use one pulsar to do this because there's lots of noise in these pulsars and there are many other effects that could cause 
deviations of the arrival times away from our models. So instead we use an array of pulsars. We use many, many pulsars spread throughout our galaxy. And we imagine ourselves like a spider sitting at the center of a vast galactic web of detectors. And we're trying to feel for any possible things or changes in our web. And we can feel those changes in lots of different pulsars if it really is a gravitational wave. So all the legs of our pulsar, all the strands of our web are really different um, lines of sight that we can look for the presence of gravitational waves. And we use all of this information um, to search for gravitational waves in this particular case from black holes that are colliding together. Now the collaboration that I'm a part of and that I work closely with is called Nanograv. It's the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Uh, my team at Vanderbilt are members of this collaboration as well, and it's spread across the entire country um, and Canada as well. We use two main radio telescopes, big radio dishes. Uh, one is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. The other, um, it's, a, it's a sad story, it was the Arecibo Radio Telescope. And you may have heard that Arecibo is being decommissioned because of uh, a catastrophic accident that caused the dish to collapse. So unfortunately, we don't uh, make observations there anymore, uh, but we have a long legacy data set stretching back um, a few decades uh, that we can search for gravitational waves in. And the good thing about the kinds of gravitational waves that I search for is that they're very low frequency, which means that their influence is very long time scale. So we're searching for gravitational waves that have periods of years to decades, which is a good thing that we've got these long data sets. Now it's not just nanograv that's searching for these waves. We also have the European Pulsar Timing Array that has various telescopes scattered across Europe, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array in Australia. We also have new partners in South Africa, in India and China. We all work together within the umbrella that is the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, and we share data and we search for gravitational waves together. Now, what are we searching for? Well, in pulsar timing arrays, we're searching for not just any kind of coalescing black hole systems, we're searching for the most massive black holes in the entire universe. These are black holes that sit at the hearts of massive galaxies. And we know that most galaxies have these black holes in their centers. And we know that galaxies actually will collide with each other often over the history of the universe. That's how big galaxies are formed. Small galaxies will merge to form larger ones, and then those ones will collide with other ones. And as this happens, the black holes that sit at the centers of these galaxies will eventually find each other and form a binary system, a system of two stars, emit gravitational waves. And that's where we come in. We try to search for the gravitational waves from those black holes. And we know that these black holes, these kinds of black holes are spread throughout the universe and in most galaxies. For example, Sagittarius A star is the black hole that sits at the center of our galaxy. And it's about 4 million times as big as our sun. And this is just an image of the region around Sagittarius A star, the black hole that sits at the center of the Milky Way. But a more famous and recent example is this. This is galaxy um, M87, um, which was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. This is the first direct image of a black hole and the region around a black hole. And this black hole is 6.5 billion times as massive as the sun. And it's just an extraordinary image and achievement by the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, I said that these galaxies and the black holes that sit to their center can collide quite often over time. So let me show you what this might look like in a, in a visualization. Now, this is two galaxies colliding together which is actually more, happens more often in the history of the universe than you think. Our galaxy will collide with Andromeda galaxy in a few billion years. And as the two galaxies collide together, their resident uh, supermassive black holes will pair up and they'll form these systems that eventually churn up space time and emit gravitational waves. These gravitational waves will propagate outwards and head out of that galaxy and system of galaxies and eventually make its way to our galaxy. 
and this is where the video becomes the same as before. You see this gravitational wave now entering our galaxy, interacting with the space time between the Earth and the pulsar, stretching and squeezing that, and allowing us to search for any deviations in the arrival times of those radio pulses. Now we know that supermassive black holes should actually have um, some interesting structures surrounding them. They're not completely devoid of any material that's swirling around them. And in fact, if you look at the image behind me, my zoom background, this is a snapshot from the movie Interstellar. Um, the black hole is called Gargantua and surrounding Gargantua is what's called an accretion disk of material. This is material that's been caught essentially swirling the drain around the black hole. And as it swirls around, it, um, it actually undergoes friction, which causes it to heat up and emit radiation. The closer you get to the black hole, the, um, the more energetic that radiation becomes. Um, and so you can get uh, emission from black holes that can be in the X-rays or, or even you know, at other frequencies as well. So we'd expect black holes should, be, uh, should have some accretion disks surrounding them uh, some amount of the time. Not all black holes will have accretion disks, but some should. Um, the material that we, uh, that we see must come from outside of the event horizon. The event horizon is the point of no return below which not even light can escape from the black hole. Um, so that's why black holes are often visualized as just the absence of light. Not, even, not anything can escape from them. And at some point in the center of that event horizon region, is what we call the singularity, that region of, of incredibly high density that corresponds to the actual black hole itself. But the, the takeaway message here is that while black holes are indeed black, they should be surrounded by other material that we can see and that we could use as a telltale signature of the presence of black holes. In fact, in our searches for gravitational waves using pulsars, even though we're searching for gravitational waves, there might be other instruments that look at electromagnetic waves that could look at any possible signature of gas swirling around the system of two black holes. And that would allow us to get what we call a multi-messenger detection. Multi-messenger astronomy is a relatively new concept. The idea is that we fuse information from gravitational waves together with information from electromagnetic waves and we try to build a more complete portrait of the system we're looking at. In this case, there would be gas swirling around the black holes. That gas would emit radiation that we can detect using conventional telescopes. But the two black holes themselves would be producing gravitational waves that we could detect with our pulsar time and array uh, observations. So that would allow us to get a more complete view of these amazing objects, these amazing supermassive black holes that are billions of times as big as the sun. So we're getting close. Um, we had a very nice result um, published um, and gained some attention last year. And it seems like we may be getting the first signs, the possible first hints of gravitational waves. We don't know for sure yet. And of course we, we can't claim anything yet, but we have what could be the first signs. Only time will tell whether we actually have gravitational waves or whether it's some sort of noise that we haven't accounted for. That's always a possibility. Uh, but this is very exciting. We should know within the next year or two what we have. And so it's a waiting game. Uh, but for me, it's also a lot of work on my team as well. We have to go out and make sure we have more observations. Um, and Nanograv as a whole has to make sure that we search for these uh, very carefully um, so that we can eventually find these low frequency gravitational waves. So if you take away anything this evening, I hope you take away that the universe is a rich symphony in gravitational waves. Here's a lovely image of the Nashville Symphony. Um, I hope we can get back to see it soon. Um, in the LIGO part of the symphony, we have high frequency violins producing lots of high frequency signals of relatively small black holes. At mid frequencies, we would have the LISA detector this space-borne detector of three satellites that could uh, measure tens of thousands of, uh, of different objects in our galaxy 
and also bigger black holes than LIGO could see. And then at the lowest frequencies, what we call the nanohertz frequencies, you have the percussion and you have the drums and the, and the bass, lots of these low frequency signals, low frequency um, tones that really mark out the biggest black holes in the universe. And that will allow us to paint a more complete picture of how galaxies have merged over the history of the universe and also how we build such gigantic black holes in the first place. So I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Tietz and uh, all of the Dio staff again for the opportunity. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Always interesting to learn more and more about the gravitational waves and what they can teach us about the universe. So I'm excited to see what we're going to be uh, learning from um, the experts like you and you know, the next decade or a couple of decades. So uh, we do have some questions. Um, let's see. So the, the simulation at the, towards the beginning where, you, where we had the really nice video of the two black holes that were uh, you know, rotating around one another, then they eventually merge and you see the, mm -hmm. the ripples go out. Um, so you had said that it was very luminous in gravitational waves. So um, just to be clear, if we were watching this system with a telescope and we could actually see it, we wouldn't, we, would we have seen any light coming from that or would it have been just purely the gravitational waves? It would be purely the gravitational waves. There's no way you could see this with a conventional telescope. Mm -hmm. um, so luminous, yeah, luminous may, might sound like a misnomer, um, but it really is highly energetic and highly powerful, mm -hmm. but it's all in gravitational waves. So it's hidden away from conventional telescopes. Okay. Um, the pulsar that you had mentioned, uh, what was it? Uh, B1913 plus 16. So you had mentioned that it was uh, a neutron star orbiting around a, or orbiting with a quote regular star, if you will. And it was noted that that, that interval was changing because they were, their orbits were decaying. And so they should eventually collide. Um, was there a, um, an estimated time scale of how long it'll be before that would happen? There is, and the number escapes me right now, but it's, it's not any time in the near future, not in human lifetimes anyway. Uh, yeah. This would be more likely millions of years. Okay. Um, so back to Lisa. Um, so we actually had, it looks like a couple of questions about that. Could you say a little bit more about Lisa? For example, uh, are the satellites able to stay precise distances apart? And how important is that separation? And would things like uh, light pressure from the sun or uh, micrometeorite impacts, would that get these, uh, these uh, components of the antenna out of alignment to where it would, it would basically mess up the observations? Yes, to all of those things. Um, so that Lisa, Lisa will be a very complicated system of satellites to fly and they'll be arranged in, um, in a specific pattern that will allow them to stay in free fall around the sun. So they, they should maintain this pattern if gravity were the only thing active on them. But as you rightly said, and as the, the asker of the question said, um, there'll be light pressure, there'll be you know possible interference from micrometeorites. Um, it's, it's impossible to say, but um, each satellite will be equipped with micro Newton thrusters, very small thrusters that should allow it to perform course corrections in case it needs to. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's see, we got some other questions here. Do gravitational waves from different events interfere, such as constructively or destructively? Uh, with each other, or does the wave metaphor not really work in that way? I mean, it should work in that way, yes. I mean, gravitational waves should constructively um, interfere and destructively interfere. It's not an observation that we uh, hope to make in the near future, um, but the wave analogy is, uh, it does hold in, in those circumstances as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, what pulsar time and arrays are trying, are trying to find is, it's really the, the sum of lots and lots of gravitational waves together. And those will sum together um, to produce something that doesn't look like a nice pattern. It'll, be, it'll look essentially like noise wandering slowly over time because you've got lots and lots of these signals jumbled together, adding on top of each other. Um, and that'll produce 
something that looks noise-like, but it'll be correlated between different pulsars in a very distinctive way. So there, there'll be a sharing of information between the different pulsars and we can use that and leverage that to find the gravitational waves. Okay. So when you say uh, um, the, the frequency that you're going to be looking at is nanohertz, um, so these, gravita these gravitational waves from the very large uh, or the, the most massive black holes, would those be more long wavelength um, gravitational waves? But when you sum them all together, you don't really see those very long gravitational waves. You see their sum, which is ends up being uh, what, what you said looks like a, a bunch of noise. That's exactly right. Yeah. So individual individual systems of, of black holes would look like a nice wave pattern that we're familiar with seeing. But really, we see the entire universe of gravitational waves, and we can't filter them out very well. Um, and all of these gravitational waves add together. And instead of producing something nice and wave-like, it appears, you know, kind of jagged and noise-like. But it is noise with structure that is long time scale. Um, what I mean by that is it looks kind of random, but it varies on long time scales, kind of like the stock market, right? It just moves slowly over long time scales. Um, and those time scales are years to decades. So we're, so we're still looking for very low frequency signals. Okay. Um, how frequent are events, uh, for example, uh, black holes merging that cause the detectable waves uh, that we observe with LIGO? Is it something that's relatively rare so that we got lucky in about 2015? Or is this, uh, uh, or was it just finally up in time to observe them? So are we basically going to continue seeing lots and lots of these detections? That's a great question. Um, the, you know, the answer is that the first detection may have been lucky uh, because it was much louder than anybody thought it would be. Um, the black holes were heavier than people thought they would be. But since that time, many more have been discovered. I, I didn't mention this, but there are now about 50 gravitational wave systems that have been discovered by LIGO. Uh, and in fact, there was a very special type of system that was not black holes, but it was neutron stars. And those neutron stars collided together. The great thing about that system is that um, it was actually material colliding together, you know, neutron star, neutron star, colliding, producing gravitational waves, but also detonating and producing electromagnetic waves. So the entire astronomical community worldwide was able to go and look at this thing. Um, so that's a very special event as well. The answer is that these systems are colliding all the time. Um, and actually in in my part of the problem in pulsar timing arrays, um, I can say that there, there should be gravitational waves in the data that we have because these systems are not colliding anytime soon. They're for all intents and purposes, eternal emitters of gravitational waves and they won't, they won't collide for another couple of million years. So it's somewhere in our data, we have gravitational waves. We just have to tack on some more data to make that more significant and more robust. Okay, and so I, I would imagine that for these these systems that are taking millions of years to finally collide, is that where you would get uh, very very long waves coming from? Yes, exactly. It, in our in our data, it would look like a very low frequency, long time scale um, wave, but as it got closer and closer to actually merging, the, it, it pitches up. It gets higher frequency and shorter time scale. It also gets louder in gravitational waves as well. And eventually you get this burst of gravitational waves whenever the, uh, the collision happens. Mm -hmm. And a, a very interesting thing happens after that where um, the black hole, the resulting black hole can almost um, ring like a bell. And what I mean by that is it, it sends out these gravitational waves that have very specific tones um, that are associated with how big the black hole is mm -hmm. um, and some other properties as well. So it kind of rings down like a bell. Interesting. Um, why do larger black holes produce lower frequency gravitational waves than the smaller ones? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the frequency of the gravitational wave um, emission is associated with 
the, the mass of the objects that are actually producing the gravitational waves. Um, so roughly speaking, um, in, uh, in the mid band, we've got black holes that can produce you know, gravitational waves that are millihertz frequencies. And those black holes that produce those frequencies are 10,000 times as big as the sun to 10 million times as big as the sun. LIGO is higher frequency, smaller black holes. Uh, pulsar time and arrays are lower frequency, even more massive black holes. Unfortunately, we can't get bigger black holes than that. You know, the biggest black holes that we think we know about are roughly 10 billion times as big as the sun. Um, and that's about it. Um, so it, it is possible that we could detect gravitational waves at much, much lower frequencies using um, information contained in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, we can look for interesting patterns in that cosmic microwave background um, and see if gravitational waves from the dawn of the universe itself are imprinted in that, uh, in that background. That's a really neat idea. Never thought about something like that. Yeah. Um, what has been the biggest surprises since actually discovering gravitational waves? Well, I think everyone, everyone expected that gravitational waves would eventually be discovered. Um, but the, the amazing thing for, for me has been seeing it grow into a field of astronomy and seeing it being used to map out how the behavior of black holes and take a census of black holes across the universe. Uh, you know, I said LIGO now has about 50 detections and those are being used to unveil information about you know, the, the masses of the black holes, uh, how often they merge over the history of the universe, where the black holes came from, what kind of stars they came from, all that sort of information. Uh, and that's only possible because you know, LIGO was not built to detect gravitational waves. It was built to do gravitational wave astronomy, which is an entire field. Um, and of course, another amazing aspect has been seeing the, the, the collision of those two neutron stars. Um, to produce gravitational waves, but also many other types of signals as well. Okay. Um, I think our last, well, um, no, actually two questions. Uh, so how quickly does it usually take galaxies to collide? So would we start getting the, the gravitational wave detection as they're starting to get near collision, or is it going to be more detectable once they've really started colliding and we start getting these black holes uh, at the centers of these galaxies near one another? This takes a very, very, very long time. This takes billions of years. Um, and in fact, you know, even, even though the black, the, the gravity, sorry, let me backtrack, even though the galaxies may collide, it takes an even longer time for the black holes to find each other and to get close enough that they can send out gravitational waves that we can detect. So we're talking billions of years here. By the time the black holes are close enough together that they're sending out gravitational waves, it's very likely that an external observer would see a galaxy that just looked like a normal galaxy, a big galaxy, but a pretty normal galaxy. Uh, because all of the, you know, all of the hoopla that associated with the, the merger of the two galaxies mm -hmm. uh, has died down. So it just looks regular. But inside there, you've got two black holes that are sending out gravitational waves. Okay. Um, I think our final question is, uh, does our understanding of gravitational waves have any impact on observing things via gravitational lensing? That's a great question. Yeah, they're inextricably linked to the theory of general relativity. Um, now it's, it's possible that um, there are certain types of environments that uh, are good for gravitational lensing, like clusters of stars. Uh, clusters of stars are um, did we did we lose Dr. Taylor? Are you back? I, I think that you're you're muted. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, I'm not sure either. So um, I 
I don't think that we heard that the last part of that. Um, the last part was me saying that um, the, the system of stars, like a cluster of stars, mm -hmm. could lens light, um, but it could also contain lots of black holes in those clusters. And those, those black holes could be sending out gravitational waves as well. Okay. Um, but it's, it's all built on the theory of general relativity that Einstein developed. Okay. I think that that was our, our last question. Well, Dr. Taylor, it has been a pleasure to have you tonight. I've learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else that has been watching has learned a lot. And I wanna thank you for just taking the time to speak with us tonight about this really exciting field. And um, I, along with everybody else here at, at Dyer Observatory, are, we're really looking forward to seeing what results come out of this and hope to see your name in, in the headlines again uh, with these discoveries of these gravitational waves from these really, really massive black holes. So thank you again uh, for, for such a wonderful evening. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much and, and also to everyone watching. Yeah, and I also want to thank everyone who has tuned in tonight to, uh, to, uh, to learn more about gravitational waves. And uh, be sure to check out our website, uh, dyer.vanderbilt.edu, for upcoming events. Uh, we will be having a virtual star party in March. Uh, we'll be doing another Meet the Astronomer talk in, in March as well. And um, any other events that we have coming up, we'll be sure to post information uh, there as well. So I want to thank um, also Brian Smokler uh, with VU News and Communications and also Alex Rockefeller and uh, Helen Morissett for helping out this evening as well. So uh, thank you all and hope you all have a, a great evening and a great weekend and be sure to stay safe out there. See you next time.